Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome back. I think this is our first episode with an actual guest in the studio in a few weeks. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. Hello, and this is also the first episode of the new year. The first real episode of the, the new year. The first episode of the new year. Yes. And we're joined by special guest, Audrey Eshrey. Hello. That's Spinnerin on Twitter, in case you didn't <laughs> In case you didn't know. learn my first name at any point. Yeah. <laughs> I always wonder, because Cammy, I'm Cammy, and I'm Cammy Chaos on Twitter, <laughs> so I always like to assume it's easier for people to remember my name. Do you find that people call you Spinnerin a lot when they meet you? Usually only in kind of a goofy we're all Twitter people context. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not um, not too seriously. I have yet to have somebody, you know, like introduce me to their spouse as Spinner that mm -hmm. I can recall. Although I'm sure somebody will now be sending me mm -hmm. a direct message saying, no, really, I did. Do you remember that one time? I didn't know your name at all. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you faked it well. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Caligator and Caligator is celebrating something kind of special soon. It's first birthday. Happy birthday Just to Caligator. Pretty neat. <laughs> Especially since when we started it, I really had an idea of what would happen for maybe six months. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I just thought, you know, like, oh, we'll have a calendar then. Okay. So we're done. For people who don't know what Caligator is, can you give us kind of a simple explanation? So Caligator is a Portland technology community calendar. But it's also a piece of open source software. And it aggregates calendar feeds from a variety of sources. Because it wouldn't be Portland if it wasn't open source. It helps. <laughs> so you thought it was going to go for six months? Well, I, I knew we'd have a calendar after that, but um, I, I think the thing that I, I've been kind of mentally uh, remarking on the last couple weeks is that I really didn't have an idea of what the development process would look like past mm -hmm. that first six months. I thought, you know, we'll get to like OSCON and that's all open sourcey and we'll have a calendar and we'll be able to show it off. <laughs> and that, that was really it. That was like as far ahead as I envision this thing. So it's pretty neat to, you know, be working with people on it, you know, still a year later and still be developing things for it and still have all this excitement about it, you know, mm -hmm. not just, oh yeah, that thing you did last year. So what, where has most of the support come from for it? Uh, geographically or like people wise or? The use of it, the, the need for it. Well, um, the, the user, so I, I was thinking of it really as a user group mm -hmm. calendar, you know, the um, like the Portland Ruby Brigade and the Pearlmongers and those kinds of organizations. And uh, while there's been a lot of adoption in that area, we've definitely also had a ton of people from the business community, like technology business community, sign on um, from the sort of, what was I calling it, the technologically enhanced social activity <laughs> <laughs> quadrant, you know, yeah. like beer and blog and yeah. things like that, that, that have a strong social component, but um, really wouldn't exist like they do without technology of some sort. Uh, and so sort of those areas, I think, have grown hugely because there's a way to actually find out what's going on. Um, and, you know, before we weren't seeing those events kind of in the, the big aggregate form that it's we are now. Another way to pull people out from behind their computers and put to a face yeah. To the names. And that, that's usually crucial. You yes, know? it is. In Portland, it's crucial. <laughs> Anywhere, though. Yeah. I, I feel really sorry for people who are, especially developers, who are trying to work in the middle of nowhere with no one they can talk to in person except for their coworkers, because um, I, I think I've just gotten so much from being able to, to mingle with people, right, who work on similar things. And, yeah. 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 Is there anything else that's going to happen with it? With Caligator? Mm-hmm. Well, we are going to have a birthday party on the 24th after our code sprint. Mm -hmm. And so um, the code sprints, we work on the code, mm -hmm. obviously, but they're they're really open to anybody who wants to come and talk about Caligator and see what we're doing. Um, and there are usually a lot of things that need to get done that aren't just coding. <laughs> we always have like documentation and testing and um, figuring out if the application is doing what we actually need it to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of just this ongoing process, right, of keeping on top of things because it looks finished and it is finished in a lot of I mean it's very usable right you put events on there it's very workable but there are all these sorts of things that we want to get from it that we don't have yet so we have to keep writing code so um how many people are involved um, with the coding caligator it's about so, how many people are part of the effort well there's sort of a core group of four people and then there's 
I made a list of everybody who had contributed at some point in the last year, and I think we're at 40-something wow. people who have, you know, either come and sat in on uh, development discussions or um, contributed code or design or, you know, some part of that. It's a really make big it what community it is. effort. Yeah, it really is. And we've gotten just, you know, so much support from all over. And uh, so kind of step us through how Caligator works. I mean, it, it's a it's a cal- it's an event calendar. But it also plugs into upcoming, which is also, you know, a very, very popular calendar. So how does that work? Do I put something in upcoming and it shows up in Caligator or vice versa? So if you want to, currently, if you want to take an event from upcoming and put in Caligator, you need to give us the URL. And then we read that page and we put it into the system. Or you can add things directly. Or if you have an iCalendar feed, um, which a lot of software will create, you know, calendar software will create, then we can take that and actually re-import it as you put new events in. So, which was my original goal for it. I wanted, um, I, I think the way I phrased it was a calendar where I, we could all go to Tahiti and we'd mm-hmm. still have a calendar. You know, it would continue to update. It, it turns out to have been a little bit more complicated than that. But, but you I know, like the idea of all of us going to Tahiti. Yeah, you know, and, and we'll still have a Portland <laughs> event calendar of, of whatever's happening with the people who didn't go to Tahiti. Yeah, yeah. But Tahiti is a good idea. Especially tonight. Um, <laughs> yes. It's pretty and fun. Chaos needs to go to Tahiti right now. <laughs> right this moment. Um, so, and you said it's kind of, it, it's both an end user calendar and an open source project as well. So mm-hmm. is there a component of, you know, it's a package and someone somewhere else can grab Caligator and create their own Caligator? Is that how that works? Yeah. Step so us through that. Absolutely. Everything that you see on the site um, it really including the data because we have a way for you to download it is uh, freely usable. It's offered under the MIT open source license, which basically says it has a license. You can do stuff. <laughs> it's, hey, it's extremely open ended. Um, and so uh, right now it's not it's not like um, I'm trying to think like WordPress, right? You can give it all these sort of customizable pieces of information, you know, here's the name of your blog. We don't have that kind of templating yet. Mm-hmm. So right now you just get our Caligator, which is kind of weird if you're in Seattle, right? You know, yeah. it'll still say Portland on it. And um, so one of the things that we want to work on this year is making it so that um, but the Caligator can make it easy to find events, you know, if you're in Seattle or yeah. you're in Portland, but also if Seattle wants their own Caligator for some reason, then they could have that too. So just make it more widespread, make it yeah. community specific rather than yeah so i mean maybe you have a community with totally different needs than what we envisioned but you still need that base calendar aggregator then hopefully we can offer that too but we need more developers to make that happen (laughs) oh no (laughs) or else it'll take us months and months and months we need more developers yeah if you're a developer there's no pay but we're friendly (laughs) they smile a lot Mm -hmm. i hear they like to go to tahiti (laughs) how much do you pay is it uh (laughs) <laughs> you you can drink beer with everyone when we're there you <laughs> if you buy your own beer. <laughs> if you buy your own beer. Where do you guys get together yeah. so, for Sprint? Uh, Cube Space very very generously has donated our meeting space for the entire last year. So when we meet up, we meet up at Cube Space, and then um, almost always people go someplace and get beer and food after. Thank you, Cube Space. Yeah, Cube Space. It's very cool this way, and Cube Space uses our calendar, so it's kind of a win win. You're also. The Mm co-chair of the Open Source Bridge. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. So it's a conference that's going to happen this summer. I've been saying next summer for a few months, but I think it's this summer officially now that we're in 2009. I think so. Yeah, so um, after OSCON, the Open Source Conference that O'Reilly puts on, left Portland, that kind of created, but it created this great opportunity to have the most awesome open source developers conference that we could imagine. So uh, Selena Deckelman and I and a whole team of other people are in the process of putting that together. Um, over the next few months, there is a lot of, <laughs> right now there's you know, so many things that have to get nailed down to put to make it happen. It's all volunteers, grassroots, you know, we're not getting paid to put this on. We're just trying to make it so that uh, our fellow developers and ourselves can get together and really learn from each other and um, hopefully see some very cool speakers. And you have dates? We do not have. No? Do you have a general? Mid-June, probably. June-ish. Yeah, we we have a lot of paperwork to file (laughs) to get it all, like, announceable. But soon, very, very soon. And what's your biggest goal for the conference? Hmm. You know, I think 
to provide something that's really accessible mm-hmm. for for developers, right? So, um, you know, both financially accessible and accessible in terms of topics that really span a lot of areas. So you can see how your work fits into the whole universe mm-hmm. of open source. And sort of my personal goal of it is that I've been trying to poke at this idea of open source citizenship, um, you know, because with open source, it's often, you know, free, not just in the the free speech sense, but free financially, yeah. right? But for uh, open source to exist, it really needs a lot of things from its users, from its developers, from the managers, the companies that use it. And so I've been trying to figure out how we can use this conference to really talk about the concept of being a citizen of open source and uh, what that means and how you be a, a good player in the ecosystem. Uh, I like that. that you mentioned the ecosystem because that's the easiest way when someone who isn't at all. And I'm not... I, as well as I grasp some technological concepts, I have a hard time expressing them in a very technological way. And so whenever anyone asks me about open source, I tell them it's like a community garden. Yeah, it is. So, I mean, I go a little with, more in With depth, a variety that, of weird plant, correct. weird, weird, weird plants. <laughs> correct. Know? It's there for everyone to use. But if you just take stuff out of it and you're not putting stuff back in, it's not going to prosper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's It's definitely a commons in that sense. Um, and so, you know, it's this great kind of radical idea, right? That companies don't just own code and create software for you. And, you know, so heaven forbid you want to know how your word processor works, (laughs) right? I mean, maybe you don't, but if you did, you should be able to find out. I'd love to know how my word processor works. (laughs) I'm not sure I do. I'm not sure I'm ready for that knowledge though. (laughs) But, um, (laughs) your website, I can tell you, uh, (laughs) But yeah, so it, you know, it's, it's got to be this participatory thing or else it both doesn't function and it's not relevant. And especially the relevance, I think people kind of underestimate, you know, that if you're not actually participating, then somebody else is dictating what all, your entire technological existence looks mm-hmm. like. And I think, uh, you know, as technology becomes a bigger and bigger part of our lives, we have to take some responsibility there. And, and open source gives you the tools to do that if you just understand how it works. How did you get involved in open source? Well, I didn't have any money in college, <laughs> and Linux was a lot cheaper. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that was a huge part of it, really, was yeah. just needing software to do things and not being able to pay for them. And so things I could download and install, compile myself, gave me, you know, an advantage, right? So even if the software was sometimes a little weirder on the user interface perspective, at least I could have it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh yeah, so I've kind of slowly migrated from there into actually developing. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so we've talked about open source, and we've mm-hmm. talked about Caligator. Mm-hmm. And this gets brought up a lot with you, I think, but you're a woman mm-hmm. in the tech community yes. in Portland. And you're pretty big in the tech community in Portland as far as what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I want you to tell me about that. Well, I don't like being invisible at all. Good. (laughs) And lately I've been going back through old blog posts and retagging them because um, a lot of them didn't have tags. And so Mm -hmm. I've been reading all of these really angry posts from two, three years ago where I was just so frustrated with the kind of rhetoric that I was hearing around, you know, development and women's participation and women aren't even here. And, um, and I just kind of thought, you know, screw that. (laughs) That's, you know, that's, that's really stupid and frustrating. And, uh, so I need to just kind of keep doing what I want to do, but also push things, right. Mm -hmm. You know, organize something or get involved in something. If I care about it, then I need to participate. Do you feel like there was a lot of resistance on the outside, or do you think that women just aren't pushing? Oh, complicated. <laughs> I, um, you know, I think for me, it's it's been very mixed. There are things that I think I get away with because I'm female, mm-hmm. and so I can be socially pushy in a way that I like that you're honest about that. <laughs> well, really... no, you know, I can be socially pushy in a way that I think a lot of my male colleagues yeah. would have a hard time with. Um, but on the other hand, I I do still sometimes feel very invisible and feel like, especially, you know, within Ruby programming, just, um, you know, conference after conference is happening with no women speaking or nearly no women speaking. And that's not even identified as an issue. You know, the organizers don't put that out there as a problem or as a, like, they're even aware of it. And, um, you know, back to the participatory thing, I think, well, if there are women developing, you know, in my sphere and we're not being asked to speak about it, then 
<laughs> how is that possibly representative? So, so I push a lot, you know, to, to be visible. Which a lot of people don't do. A lot of a lot of men don't push to be yeah. visible as well. Yeah, yeah. and but. so you know, I, I exploit all of my personality quirks and uh, abilities and flaws, and um, just try to be out there. Yeah. So, um, so back to uh, coding. Um, you um, have, of course, done HTML and, mm -hmm. and web coding, but you're also uh, pretty involved in the Ruby on Rails. Mm -hmm. um, efforts. Can you describe that a little bit? The reason I ask is because um, when we uh, were talking about the show earlier today, Cammy's like, so um, can you tell me what this Ruby and Rails is? And it's like, <laughs> well, let me tell you. And I gave gave my little, you know, 10,000 foot mm. description, but Your I'm sure you can make very much sense. be a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot more uh, eloquent about it. And tell us how you got into Ruby on Rails. Well, okay, I, I can probably do both at the same time. So um, when I was in high school, I first learned HTML. And I, I had just started to hear about CSS, and I thought it was kind of um, kind of a fad, like JavaScript. You know, it mm -hmm. was just going to be all blinky. So I ignored that. But I learned HTML. And so you get static web pages, right? You know, you say, here's what the document format looks like, and it shoves it through the server, and out you get a page you can read. Um, and uh, at some point people like myself realize that maybe some interactive content would be nice, you know, things that you don't have to manually update yourself. So you have software underneath there that is saying, aha, here is your web page that you're requesting with dynamic content inserted. And that's what Ruby on Rails does. It's a framework that automates a lot of the pieces of getting from the database and the templates to an actual functioning application. So where would you see it if you were looking at a website, if you were looking anywhere? Obviously, on the internet, not mm -hmm. not talking about a library book, but if you're looking, where would you see that and not know that it's happening? Where is it behind the? Does that make any sense? Kind of, yeah. So, um, well, Caligator is a Ruby on Rails site. Mm -hmm. Uses this framework. WordPress uses PHP, another programming language, to accomplish a similar result. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you are saving content and getting it back out again on a web page, you've got a web application in there somewhere. So, you know, anytime you can post a note post a comment, update your calendar, um, send a letter to the president, you know. <laughs> any a shopping cart. Yeah, shopping cart. Anytime you're doing something interactive like that, there's code behind there serving that up. And Ruby on Rails is one specific yes. branch of that. It's one kind. Yeah, so, um, and the way that I got into Ruby on Rails is actually kind of uh, silly. <laughs> so PHP is all over the place on the web, right? Mm -hmm. It's really popular. It also has a reputation for being kind of messy and poorly used. And um, and so I, I got to a point where I really wanted to learn some kind of a web programming uh, framework or language or something. And I thought, you know, I don't want to do PHP because I, I hear people complaining about PHP all the time. I don't care if that's the easy thing to do. So let's try this new Ruby on Rails thing, which was still, um, at that time, it was still not very stable. It, mm. it went through a lot of changes, which have made my life as a programmer very interesting. <laughs> you know, it's like um, it's suddenly, I don't know, you have to do six new things to get your shoes on. It's like <laughs> that kind of, oh, gee, they changed that. Huh? It's and like when you're first learning to do something, like when the first time you learn to tie your shoes, you learn to do it and you're Yeah, okay. and if you got new shoelaces every time yeah. for the first year, yeah. it'd be kind of hard. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how my first year of Ruby on Rails was, where wow. I was just kind of going... Okay, so I just got comfortable and you changed it. <laughs> you know, what happened here? So, um, but it, that's opened up a ton of opportunities for me because, as it turns out, Ruby on Rails took off. And Ruby underneath that, the programming language that it uses is a really great programming language. And uh, so, I, you know, I really appreciate having those tools available to work with. It's come out nicely. So, um, as Cammy um, so strategically takes a drink... Um, <laughs> <laughs> So where would you put, uh, you know, as far as the programming languages, you've got C, C++, mm -hmm. you've got uh, Ruby, you've got JavaScript. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the hierarchy there? I mean, kind of for all of us non-programmers, how does, how does the hierarchy of languages work? Or is it just kind of a choose your own uh, your own language for... I don't understand the question. Uh, that's okay, I do. Well, yeah. I, uh, no, I think I can explain. <laughs> See, so, she does. All right, so <laughs> the computer <laughs> down at its its raw level is all binary, right? Correct. One, zero, one, zero, one, yeah, all I the way. I get that. Okay, 
So you have um, lower and We're higher. We're schooling you now. <laughs> I need chaos. information. I'm a sponge. Give me the information. Okay. So you have lower level and higher level languages, which get you further as you go higher. So like, the would HTML be the, lower because it just does? Need, HTML is orthogonal like, to that. Okay. It's it's totally so it, it's like because HTML just does basic standard stuff. It doesn't do yeah. like ooh fancy. It, HTML is just formatting. Correct. Right. So, um, that's like, doc- like document, over the- like document. HTML, I can do yeah. HTML if I have mm-hmm. the book there to, look but if up you did it every day for a year, you'd, you'd have all that Correct. stuff memorized. Exactly. You have to think about it. Exactly. But so in terms of programming languages, C is like down here closer to the computer where okay. you have to do things like tell it how to allocate memory. Um, oh, now I get the question. Okay. <laughs> and then as you go higher up the stack into something like Ruby, Ruby handles a lot of those issues for you. And so you can just say things like do this three times. Okay. Bye. And it works. Yeah. Now, this is where my sci-fi nerd comes in, but Ruby is getting closer to the computer thinking for itself. Mm. Or the program thinking for itself. Isn't the program, you're telling it what you want it to do and it's doing more of the work for you? But there are people who have decided the way that it goes down the stack. Correct. So uh, the computer doesn't really get to decide very much of it. Correct. It's more but, like it's been uh, well trained. Correct. It, <laughs> it's more like a, a well trained dog, but it, it is it's it's pulling its own weight at that point. It gets written and then it's doing. Th- I'm just talking to myself yeah, into a no. hole. But I mean, so so as a programmer, <laughs> on. you get you get to spend more time on your end result with a higher level language. You know, working in Ruby, I get to spend more time saying. So what I really want is a tree with eggplant on it. And, you know, and then the computer decides how You've to make that happen. You've been playing too much Sims, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I plant one of my default nouns that I use for examples. Um, See, what you said made sense with what I was asking. I just don't know that I was asking it the right way. Okay. So I feel, and I then, feel vindicated. Yeah. Even if you don't believe me. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Good time. But yeah, if you're using C, <laughs> then you have to tell it what an eggplant is in the first place. Yeah, see, that's... Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I define. I like eggplant. <laughs> no problem. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in after hours, we'll discuss what to do with an eggplant. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So um, so we talked about... So uh, back to Caligator, bringing it mm-hmm. back around. Uh, where would people find Caligator? Would it just Caligator.com? Caligator.org. Caligator. Although I think uh, Igal Koshevoy, who does a lot of the programming work on the project, very kindly, immediately, as soon as we had a name, registered the .org, the .com, the .net. So any of those will redirect. Any, anything's, is it is Caligator really just a service, or is it the UI as well? I'm I'm curious. I, or I mean, yeah, are you gonna do things with the UI, or is it just more? Maybe you want people to plug in to Caligator from their own like blog or UI. It's it's really all of that. The way that I envisioned it, it was kind of this full stack of functionality. Um, and so the, the point that I'm trying to get it to is where it's the hub in a wheel. So, you know, everything, all our calendar data comes through Caligator, but then you push it back out to your blog, you push it back out to upcoming even. You know, you push it to all these different services that you're using, but Caligator is the thing that holds that all together and makes it so that a diverse group of people can actually get at that data so you don't want it to be a destination as much as you want it to be a tool i want it to be kind of your your pathway you go through so for some people maybe all they need is a web calendar Mm -hmm. and for them caligator.org you know you go to the site you look it up that's perfect but maybe you're um you know like steve morris you're running the you know an organization that puts on a lot of events and so you need a way to take your events that you've created somewhere over here and put them into a system and then spread that out into the universe then Caligator might be the middle of your process. So, uh, and, uh, you know, does does Caligator plug into my Google Calendar as well? Mm-hmm. Or is, oh, wow. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, you can subscribe to everything on Caligator in your Google Calendar. You can also subscribe to just a specific subset of events. So maybe you search on, uh, well, Ruby and Beer was my default for a long time, but that's actually getting kind of kind of normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. I, well, I don't know, right? Blogging and something else. Pick a term. Blogging uh, and crochet work. Okay, yeah. So you are really interested in blogging and crochet. <laughs> so you can tell Caligator that you want to see on your personal calendar all blogging and crochet items, and it will give that to you. Ah, I see. Yeah. You've just won Dr. Normal over for life. He loves to crochet. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, yeah. Um, not really. 
as much as he I love to program. He also loves to blog and program. Yes, he does <laughs> all those things. So He's a blogger, a programmer, so you can and subscribe. a crochet fanatic. I think the way it works right now, <laughs> no. you have to do that individually, but you could subscribe to like each of those and then have separate calendars that uh-huh. show up on your Google calendar cool. for each item you're interested in. Cool. Mm-hmm. Wow. He really does like things that feed into his Google calendar, though. But yeah, a lot of yeah. Well, do. I just got to. He's up. hopeless with the crocheting or yeah. the blogging. Well, my Google calendars, uh, it's, it's all that bloggy and Google calendar it, stuff. It got needs worse to be when I got a Mac because now I'm like, I don't need Google. I have my iCalendar. I'm happy. Leave me alone. Ah. I subscribe to yeah. all of Calgator on my iCalendar. Oh, see now I'm happy. There you go. Right. Yeah. It's nice. You so I leave it turned off most of the time, and then when I, you know, I'm wondering, so what's going on on Wednesday? I just click the box and. It shows all the events, and I go, oh, wow, Wednesday is busy. <laughs> Wednesday is a really crazy day in Portland. Yeah. Mm-hmm. RPDX, I think they have trying to schedule their meetups on Wednesdays. And everybody said, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> I have to be six places. It's, it's Wednesday. Wednesday's the yeah. new Thursday. Wednesday's the new Thursday. That's huh? right. Is Thursday a busy day? <laughs> yes. It used to be. I just have to really, say. Really, anything that isn't a weekend? It's Friday. Oh, my gosh. It's Friday. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Friday. One thing that I... Are you a Mac or a PC? Mac. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lifelong? Uh, on and off. But you're open source, so... Yeah. So you don't run like a Ubuntu box or anything? or Not currently. Um, I switched over full-time from... So from full-time Linux to full-time Mac about three years ago, maybe? Something like that. I finally got tired of compiling all my own software. Yeah, Although Ubuntu is better that way. It's so much but, easier now with, yeah. with Ubuntu. No, so I started out on, on Slackware, where you pretty much had yeah. to do everything yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it made for, yeah. So, you know, again, the word processor, right? You need a word processor right now? Okay, well, you can pick six, but let's find out if they work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I like spell check. <laughs> spell check. That's good. really all I can say. I like to just be able to click on something and have that work. Mm-hmm. Makes me very happy. Kemi two thousand nine plan is to become a Linux guru. All right. Yeah. No, I think that there <laughs> That's may my have plan for her. <laughs> there may have been a space in my life when when I was actually like writing a little bit of code and doing a little bit of web design, and when I was using Linux, where maybe I could have gone down that path. You get the hives when you start going down that path. I you do. Just get if I have to start coding stuff, you if I have to start, if like there's too much stuff, and I'm trying to figure it out. I do. I get. I'm like. Oh my God! There's a reason I don't do this, isn't there? Yeah, yeah I get, sad. I You're get panicky and things start to like, oh, <laughs> don't panic. Yeah, you need yeah. the exactly. the Hitchhiker's Guide for sure. Yes, I need my the towel Bluetooth with with don't panic. Yes, and, the big don't panic. Yeah. Yes. Oh goodness, I need some Hitchhiker's Guide. So we were right going to close out with um, tomorrow's event. Why don't you tell two, us about there's that? There's two things I want to talk about really quickly. First, I want to say that uh, Bend is going to have their first Ignite. And it is on February... That is February 12th. February 12th. The submissions end next week. So if you're in the Bend area or you are in Portland and you didn't get accepted to Ignite Portland for some reason and you really want to submit to Ignite Bend, go to ignitebend.com and submit something. Uh, Find out about tickets. It should be a great event. I also want to let everyone know if you need help with your blog go to end bloglessness tomorrow at cube space from 12 to 5 12 to 5 end bloglessness uh, put on by portland.beerandblog.com yeah. for more information if you need to find where cube space is located so get your wordpress on 12 to 5 correct and next week on strange love live we'll have stephanie strickland and aaron weiss that's right thank you Audrey, we'll be back (laughs) in after hours in a few minutes.